Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with the same sacrifice which they offered continually year by year make those approach perfect. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, when once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. Previously saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offering according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. That by that, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnessing witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then, he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of, of these, or remission of sins, there is no longer an offering for sins. Will you join me as we pray? Dear Father, Lord, we just thank you so much as we saw the kids go out and just be reminded of the, of the children who are at church. We are grateful to you and we're thankful. And we don't take it for granted that they're here. Your word tells us that children are a gift from God. Not only just a gift to us as parents, but a gift to the body. May we be mindful of that and, and treat that each of these kids who are here as our gift, that they are a blessing to us from you. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word this morning. Help us to understand your truth. Help us to be men and women in which a spark has been ignited. And we desire to understand you and to apply your truth to our life. And that as that spark is increased into a flame, that others might be drawn to your son, Jesus. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The back of your bulletins has your sermon notes. Make sure you have that with you. You leave that. There will be some fill-ins. And, of course, you can take notes. I wish to start off by asking you a question. Does God have a plan for my life? And I really want more than a simple answer in response, a yes or a no. Because if God does have a plan, I want to know what it is. But if God doesn't have a plan, then I'm on my own. I need to figure out a plan for my own life. But if God does have a plan for my life, I want to know what it is. Because I want to be let in on the secret. I want to know what that direction is and where I'm supposed to go. Perhaps the direction of your spiritual life could be described as that game we used to play when we were children. The hot and cold game. You know, you would hide something from somebody and they would try to find it, and you say, you're getting warmer. Oh, oh, you're getting colder. Oh, you're freezing. 
And they'd closer, they'd go, oh, you're on fire, you got it, you're right there. And we would play this with them in hopes that they'd finally get what they, would, what they needed to find, and great. But if that's a spiritual life, that's sad. God's sitting, we, we think somehow God's sitting in heaven going, oh, Christian, you're getting hotter. You're getting, you're getting, you're red hot. Oh, you're drifting away, you're, you're cold. When you think of God's will, what questions normally come to your mind? What do you guys think? When you think of God's will, what are the main questions that come to your mind? What? Okay, obedience, but I guess I'm thinking when we're talking about, God, what is your will for my life? What are those questions when we're saying, I want to know God's will in what area of your life? Work? What else? God, uh, what job? Do you, where do you want me to work, God? Lord, how do you want us to worship you? What kind of music should we use? Should we have a disco ball coming down and the lights flickering around? And should we use strobe lights? Or should we get on our hands and knees? What ministry, Lord, should you call me to? I think he's calling you to Africa, Betty. They go, no, I'm pretty sure that's not it. <laughs> or you're going, Lord, please don't call me to Africa. Anywhere but Africa. But that's a question, Lord, what ministry? And here's my condition. What else? Witnessing. Okay. Marriage. Whom should I marry? How do we determine that? We get out the Yahtzee dice. What car should I buy? Where should I go to college? Should I go to college? If I do go to college, which college should I go to? There was a man who was frustrated by trying to find God's will. So he decided to look in the one place he thought he could find God's will. The Bible. And he was right. That was the perfect place to find God's will. So he decided, God, I need you to tell me your direction. So God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the word of God, and I'm going to cover my eyes, and I'm going to use my finger and point right to it. And that's how I'm going to discover your will for my life. And so he did that. And to discover his word. And his hand fell on a, on a verse called Matthew 27, verse 5, towards the end. And the verse read, and he went out and hung himself. The man was startled. He said, Lord, this must be a fluke. Surely this can't be right. So he closed his Bible again. He prayed. He said, Lord, I'm really seeking the direction for, you, for my life from you. Please give me a clear understanding. He opened the Bible back again. His finger came down. And there, lo and behold, it was on Isaiah, Old Testament, chapter 38, verse 1, towards the end. Thus saith the Lord God, set your house in order, for you will die and not live. Oh, my. This caused a man to think, Lord, I need confirmation. I need to know for sure that this is really you speaking to me. I know I have your word in front of me. So he shut the Bible again. He opened it up back up again. His eyes closed. He prayed some more. Same, same format again. Put his finger down. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 said, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, I shall establish every word. Isn't that how we discover God's word? 
in God's message by playing Bible roulette. And yet there are some who say, that's how I know God is speaking to me. Because, wow, when you have three things that seem like they randomly come together, that must be how God is working. Well, we don't have to play Bible games and little trivial things like that. Today I want to show, for, show you how you can find God's will for your life. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, it's divided into three paths. The three paths are laid out for your outline. But as we're looking at this, the paths are divided into this, the almost but not quite path. It's the almost but not quite path. The second is the pathway to please God. And the last one is the efficacy of Christ's path. We turn to the first one, the almost but not quite path. That's in verses 1 through 4 of of Hebrews chapter 10. It's that advertisement of good things ahead. He says, for the law having a shadow of good things ahead. It's while you're driving down the road and you see food ahead. (laughs) It's only 300 miles. And maybe you're driving down Highway 80 and you're in Nevada. And there's nothing out there. Or maybe they're saying, great things ahead. And, or I remember as a little kid, they're promising a park with slides and all these wonderful things. And you're thinking, Mom, Dad, can we go there? It looks so exciting. And they kept on showing more and more of these. Good things are coming ahead. And you get there and it's closed. It's for the, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of these things. Why were the Old Testament sacrifices inferior? We read through this. Why was the Old Testament sacrifices inferior? Didn't the Lord ordain these sacrifices? Were these sacrifices not practiced for hundreds of years? Were the people not sincere in their sacrifice, in their worship? When people came to make these offerings, weren't Weren't they sincere in their worship? Were not the nature of the sacrifices the reason why they were inferior? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says they are shadow. They're not the real thing. The Old Testament sacrifices were a picture or a shadow of what the Lord would do in the future on the cross. They were pointing to what was in the future. They were temporary. They could not accomplish anything that was permanent. Remember throughout the Old Testament, the blood covered your sin. It covered your sin. It didn't remove and take away. It's just covering. Imagine covering up your trash can. Do you want the trash out of your house? Or do you want somebody just to cover it up? It stinketh. Let's cover up the trash. Push it down, pack it down, put it somewhere. The point, but verse 1 says, but these are shadows pointing to something good ahead. But you can't help but ask yourself, what are the good things that are coming ahead? Well, we keep looking out the window as we're driving, and we see scenery of repetition and remembrance. The picture of the line of people that are streaming into the tabernacle with their offering. Imagine, if you will, where there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people who are in line with their animals coming to sacrifice for their sin. And what would you be doing if you saw people lined up going to make sacrifices for their sin? Let's be honest just for a moment. Let's pretend we're back in the Old Testament. And we're all lined up going through a door going to make our sacrifices. What would you be thinking of one another? Can I be honest? Go ahead, Joey. Yeah! I would be wondering that. I'd be going, okay. I wonder what Jonathan did last week. I wonder why he has to bring bring a sheep this week. Last week, we only brought a turtle dove. Must have been a big sin. You know? I'd be thinking that. I would be thinking, maybe life wasn't so good. And I see some of us go, man, they're still in this line. Sin must be controlling their life. And they'd be thinking the same thing probably about me. Wondering, am 
Why can't they get control of the sin that's in their life? You go, but we're all there. But yeah, it's that repetition of sin again and again and the remembrance of sin. Who wants to be remember, reminded of the old habits of life, of the personal struggles, of the embarrassments? But there's this annual reminder of the repetition of your failures. There were no remission of sin. Remission means forgiveness. The power to see the person no longer associated with the sin. That's what it's referring to. But in verses 3 through uh, uh, 2, 3, and 4, all it's talking about, all you're seeing is the sin, the sin, the sin. And every year we're having to make a sacrifice, make a sacrifice, and remember the sacrifice that of all, or we have to remember all the sins that we did before. There was a family reunion in which a dad would tell a story about a son. Which he said, son, every, every year, the dad always would say, remember, son, remember that time that I had to... I caught you with that rock in your hand, and you picked it up, and I told you, don't throw that rock, and you threw that rock, and you broke the window, and out came the police officer, and he stuck you in the back of the police officer car and drove you through town. Yeah, Dad, I remember. You tell that same story every year. Yeah, but it's a good story. Yeah, Dad, you told that story when I first met my fiancé. You told that same story, Dad, on our wedding day. Dad, you told that same story when we announced the birth of our child. Dad, you told that same story when my son was graduating from high school. Dad, you tell that same story because you want to remind me of my failures. Why do we do that? Why do we like to bring up the failures? what we've done. See, that's the almost but not quite path. That's the Old Testament. That's the sacrifices of the Old Testament. It's the almost but not quite. Because it never takes us where we need to go. We need to go on a different path. We need the pathway to please God. It is for this pathway in verses 5 through 10 where it begins with a therefore. And that therefore draws our attention to the reason the Messiah came into the world. It's interesting that he quotes Psalm 40 verses 6 through 8 to show the single purpose. Let me read again verse 5 through 7. Therefore, when he came into the world... He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. What a contrast. Sacrifice and offering you don't desire, but you prepared a body. Hmm. You don't want to sacrifice, but you did prepare a body. You prepared a sacrifice. And burnt offerings, repeated again, burnt offering and sacrifice for sin. You've got no pleasure in going through the ritual and routine. And then I said, Behold, I've come. In the volume of the book, this is written of me. Meaning throughout the Old Testament, this great truth is written about Jesus Christ. And the main purpose that Jesus Christ came is the simple truth. It's the pathway to please God. To do your will. But to do your will, you must know God's will. How do we know God's will? Well, to start with, and this is one of the things I want to hit on, there are three things I want to share with you that you can know God's will. In 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 4, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. I want, to, I want you to be able to walk out today and say, I know God's will for my life, at least in these three areas. There are more than three areas that we can point to, but because of time constraint, I cannot go through all the passages of the Scripture and say, this is God's will for your life. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8, it says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passions of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage 
of or defraud his brother in, the, in these matters, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. First off, let me just identify this. Notice, it is unmistakable that this is God's will for your life. He states it right there in verse 3. It is God's will for your life and for my life. That we what? That we abstain from sexual immorality. What does that mean? I know some people take that and go, that means God doesn't want anybody to have sex. No. I hate to remind everybody, God is the inventor, the creator of sex. That might sound shocking to say something like that in a church. But it needs to be said. It was invented and created by God. Therefore, it is glorious. It is a good thing. It was designed for a marriage relationship. And it's not to be used anywhere else. We are to be different from the unsaved world. That's what he's referring to in verses 4 and 5. That you should know how to possess your vessel. Now, I know there's some translation decisions that you have to make, whether that vessel is referring to your wife or it's referring to your own body. But either way, it's referring to self-control. And verse 5 says, not in the passions of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So the comparison is there. There are those who don't know God, and therefore they do not, they're not expected to live like God, godliness. And therefore, they're not following God's will. But those who do know God's will, they are expected to live like in obedience to God, following God's will, like Christ does. Christ says, I came to do your will. I'm following the pathway to please God. I know God's will, therefore I'm going to do God's will. And according to this, if we are going to follow God's will, we're going to live a life that's of purity. We're different from the world. God has called you to be holy, to be separate, to be different. Lest we forget that sex is to be encouraged in marriage. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage bed is undefiled. I think in our overreaction as the pendulum has swung so far, it's almost like it's a taboo. We don't want to talk about it. We shouldn't talk about it because it will stir up and cause bad things. No, it should be promoted as... Hey, it's a great thing, and when you're married, you're going to love it. We tell kids, when you're 16, you're going to be able to drive a car. It's going to be awesome. You've got responsibilities to go with it. And when you're 18, you become a voter, a registered voter. You can vote. You've got responsibility. At 21, you're legal to drink. Be foolish to do that, but you're legal to do that. And when you're married, you can have sex. There's no age limit, but when you're married, that's the time. But that's God's will for you. That's one of the areas it's God's will. The second area of God's will is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn your Bibles right. It's your submission. Your submission. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man or institution of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Notice notice this, it is unmistakable That it's God's will for your life. And what are we required to do? We are required to submit. Not seeking my own interest, but rather assuming a voluntary commitment to the service of others. I don't care whether you have an R at the end of your voting ballot, or a D, or an I, or whatever it is. For the Christian, it is submission. Unless you forget, 
Peter was the leader of the world when Peter's writing this is a man by the name of Nero. Immoral? Absolutely. A tyrant? Absolutely. And yet, he is, call, he is calling on the Christian to be submissive to this type of person. Over the last two elections, I have noticed a great polarization between two of the candidates or, or two of the presidents we've had. And we have said horrible things about these two presidents. There has not, from the Christian realm, there has not been a sense of, but we are to submit. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like. Why does God want us to submit? Because we are a witness to the world. Because people are looking to find fault in us. And we are to prevent them from finding fault. There was a man that I was, I was watching give an example of this. There was an evangelist who said, hey, I need $45 million because I need to buy a jet that can get me around the world in one stop. And I'm telling you right now, if Jesus was alive today, he would have a jet like this and he wouldn't be riding a donkey. I don't know where this guy's theology is. I don't know this guy. I've never heard of this guy. If Jesus was alive today and he was flying a jet, he would be flying coach because that's where the people are. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he was always with the people. He'd probably be going bus or walking. You know, those are the kind of things where people look at and then they find fault with. We don't want to be doing things that people are going to be pointing a finger at. We want to be... Promoting our submissive attitude. In verse 16, he says, As free, yet not using our liberty as a cloak of vice or wickedness, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king or honor the leader. That's for us. That is God's will for us. I wonder what impact the world would have if we submitted more and felt less entitled. We spent more time focusing on obeying laws. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a time in which we may have to disobey the law. But remember, we're going to have to face the consequences. And the only time Scripture talks about us disobeying the law is when it is in conflict with what God says about proclaiming Christ. John and Peter faced that, and they were thrown in jail. Paul faced that, and he was thrown in jail. And Paul didn't, and Paul got beat. And all those things worked out for God's glory. And remember the jail, the jail keeper? What happened to him? His whole, did Paul say, you know, I hate being stuck in jail, and this is unfair, and this is, un, this is wrong? No, he started singing Christian songs. He started singing about the glory of God, and the family accepted Christ as the Savior, the jailkeeper. What an impact that made. People are watching. Was it fair for him to go to jail? No. People aren't concerned whether we are treated fair. They want to know if we are real deal, if we're real, if we are, when we are persecuted, whether we are really, truly Christians. If we follow our God. That leads us into the next one. We're still in 1 Peter chapter 4. Your suffering. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and thought, hey, I accepted because I was told that everything would be hunky-dory and wonderful. I'm sorry, someone lied to you. That's not true. 1 Peter, verse 12 through 19, it says, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when, he is glory, when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, keep that in mind, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, 
It's not that you're reproached for something else. If you are rebuked because you are standing for the name of Jesus, blessed are you, for the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evil, evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify in God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of our God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. The thing to notice there, again, this is God's will. Suffering is part of the Christian life. What type of suffering? Are we to suffer when we do bad things? Yes, because that's the consequence for doing something dumb. When we do something bad, we should suffer for that. That's the normal thing. But we are to suffer for the name of Christ. When we're standing and living a godly life and people are saying, we don't like you because, yeah, we are to suffer. We're supposed to rejoice to say they recognize that Jesus is living in me and through me. When we get our nose bloodied because we're standing for Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's, a, that's a reminder to us that we are living the Christian life. That we're on the right track. We're not supposed to go underneath the radar. We're supposed to come up on their radar. We're supposed to stand out. In a sense, Christians are expendable. Paul says, yes, and if I be offered up upon as, as a sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy, I rejoice with you all. Paul meant that if I have to give my life for your benefit, I'd be happy to do so. People are drawn to the suffering of others. It becomes an open opportunity of a great witness. And it polishes the faith of the Christian. So once we know the will of God, the real challenge is doing the will of God. We'll go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 10. It says, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once and for all. Because Christ died, you and I can do the will of God. Christ is the one who did the will of God. We've been set apart once and for all. It's a done deal. Believers are partakers of Christ's obedience. Believers are in a permanent, continuous state of sanctification. In theology, we call this positional sanctification. In daily practice, we are trying to live up to that truth. And the truth is that we are holy in the sight of God. You stand before God right now as a holy child that he loves. And this is the path that pleases God. In truth, you are his beloved. And day by day, as you come to realize and recognize that in your life, it will show forth, and others will see that. And the efficacy of Christ's path, as we look at verses 11 through 18, let me quickly go through that the pathway is completed. It's a completed pathway in which Christ has completed the road. There's a contrast between the incomplete of what the priest did and the complete work of Christ. The basic idea of, of perfection is to bring to completion accomplishment the full, reaching, the full reach of the goal. In verse 11, he says, every priest stands and ministering daily. But verse 12, he says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He put and completed by one offering, he allowed all believers to have a completed pathway. It's a done deal. You don't have to do any more work. 
This makes every believer set apart from sin. This makes every believer acceptable to God. This allows every believer complete access to God. There's no more work to be done. You don't have to do more things to try to please God or to try to make your standing better before God because Christ has already done everything to allow you to have complete access to God. So if you feel that you have to do one thing to try to improve before God will allow you to come see you, that's not it. God accepts you because God loves you because the pathway has been perfected. Christ's offering secures perfectly the remission of sin. Verse, eight, verse 18. He says, now there is remission or forgiveness of, of these. There is no longer an offering for sin. Because of what Christ has done and laid out this one sin, therefore, there is no reason for another sacrifice to be given. For the Jewish believer, this is the question in which they are asking, should we return back to the old system? And, per, and do what? Pretend that their sin can be dealt with by providing more and more sacrifices? What further goal would be offering up another lamb or a turtle dove? What would that do for them? Absolutely nothing. But for the modern believer, your sins and my sins are forgiven completely. And we are not to live in the past, we're to live in the future. Because all of our sins have been dealt with perfectly, completely. Therefore, you don't have to struggle with those sins. A teenage girl came forward at a camp meeting in which she wanted to come forward because all the other teenagers had come forward. She wanted to come and confess her sins because she saw her friends do so. At that camp, many of the kids were coming forward and taking a red ribbon that represented their sin and lay it on a cross. But this young teenager didn't feel comfortable of going forward and putting her sins on the cross in a symbolic gesture. She didn't feel that she could do that because she had already given herself to many boys. And that her sins were different than the sins that other kids had been dealing with. And God couldn't forgive her of her sin. She met with the counselor, and the counselor spent time talking with her. And she struggled with the guilt of those sins. She couldn't let go of those sins. Finally, after the counselor talked to her and said that Christ paid for all of her sins, Christ has dealt with those, and Christ is going to forgive and forget her sins. He's not going to hold on and remember those sins, but it's up to her to decide whether she wanted to believe in Jesus Christ or not. Nobody in this room, in that room was going to make her, but it's up to her, and her sin has to be forgiven. And it was through Christ. Finally, the struggle was so intense, she relented and surrendered herself to Christ. She walked up and put the ribbon on the cross, and she came down in tears. It wasn't putting the ribbon on the cross that did anything. It was the fact that she surrendered to Jesus Christ. Something had changed in this girl's life. At one moment she was struggling as the burden of all the sin and all the boys that she had been immoral with was holding her in a seat and she couldn't get up and go. And the next moment she was freed from her sin and she was freed from the guilt and the tears weren't tears of sorrow, the tears were tears of joy. 
because she'd been given a new path. See, that's a pathway that's open to everybody in this room. Regardless of your sin, regardless of where you're at in your life or what you've done. There's an almost but not quite path that will get you almost there, but it won't bring you. What you need is the pathway that pleases God. And that's the efficacy, that's the work that Christ has done. That's Christ's path. Because he's the only one who has completely dealt with sin once and for all. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, why not today? If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you said, I've done that, but today you've, you've learned some things about God's will for your life, we've talked about these three things. And you're thinking, you know, I, I know this, this is God's will for my life, but I haven't been doing it. I'd like you to commit yourself to following God's will for your life. Because you won't be walking the right path until you start doing it. Your life won't change until you start becoming obedient to Jesus Christ. That girl had to surrender say I'm going to be obedient your life won't change until you say I'm going to be obedient to his will let's pray Heavenly Father Lord we just thank you for your word we thank you for the demonstration of Jesus Christ who came in the likeness of us in flesh demonstrated that obedience can be done. In weakness of flesh, he faced the temptations. Not uncommon, same temptations that we face. But his eyes and heart was focused upon you, Lord. We get distracted, and, and Lord, we're here today to do business with you and to get straight. We ask, Lord, that as you're prompting our hearts, that we would get on the right path with you. As I've spoken today, and some of you are, maybe you haven't been on the path, you haven't been following the will of God. If you made a decision today that you, you need to start following the will of God, I just ask you to raise your hand. Nobody else is looking, everyone else heads down. Just raise your hand and say, I'm going to start following the will of God. As, as this has been uh, made available to me, I'm going to commit myself to start following God's will. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So I'm just going to pray for you and ask God to help you as, as you are obedient to him. Lord, for those who raise their hands and those who are perhaps not ready to make that commitment, I ask Lord, that you would help them. There, don't let this be a commitment to just make today and forget tomorrow, but the obedience would be a, a burning desire in their heart. We are to seek you first, and you will make all these things, give all these things unto us. We take your word as a promise. We know you are faithful. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your care for each of us. We ask, Lord, as, as we go out, you will recall your truth to us throughout the week. Thank you for being faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.